Howdy. Today let's talk about countertops. Now if you've watched my other videos, you may be surprised that I decided to go with the solid surface countertop in my van. Uh, solid surface is sometimes called Corian, or there's other brands that make it, like Formica, or this specifically is an LG HiMax product. But regardless of which brand you choose, solid surface countertops are not a very lightweight option. That said, I do think they have some other benefits, which is why I've decided to go with it in my van. So in this video, I would just like to talk about the general process of working with this stuff in case you've been intimidated or like hesitant to work with it, and then just compare it to some of the other options out there in terms of like durability, price, weight, and then just generally lay out why this is my preferred material for countertops in a van. Now, before we start, I just gotta give a couple of disclaimers. First off, I think a countertop is something in your van you should splurge on if you want. I think, you know, this is something you will interact with so many times throughout the day. You know, you will set things on it constantly. You will be cooking on this surface, which means you're gonna to have to be cleaning it constantly. So I think unlike a gimmick, like, you know, solar panels you can walk on that you'll probably never use, something like a countertop you're gonna be interacting with like intimately on a daily basis. So I think getting a material and like a surface you like is 100% worth it. Second disclaimer, I've built countertops out of solid surface materials like this, and I've built countertops out of other things. I think there's multiple right ways to build a countertop correctly, and there's a few wrong ways to build them as well, but honestly, that's personal preference. You know, I think what one person would just find to be junk, another person will be totally satisfied with. So if you've decided to go a different route in your van, like do not consider this video as some kind of personal attack on you. I'm just trying to share what I enjoy building and what I enjoy having in my van. And then third and last, I've never worked in a countertop shop. I have read like the technical literature and like the manuals on how you're supposed to work with this stuff, but I've taken a few liberties here and there to kind of apply them to how I work in vans and like what tools and what skills and like what materials I have available to me. So just take that with a grain of salt. You may want to read those manuals as well and then deduct what you're comfortable with out of that. So with that out of the way, I think a good place to start would be to kind of go over the countertop I've installed here and point out some of the unique features and then we'll get into how I built it. So first off, the countertop in this van is quite large. I've built bigger countertops in terms of like, I've had a longer countertop in a van, I've installed deeper countertops to the walls, but in this L shape, just the sheer like square foot area of it is considerable. Front to back, this thing is 79 inches this way. This portion over the kitchen sticks out 18 inches and then this back piece, that's 28 inches wide and about 22 inches front to back. If you look along the back edge here, there's a little bit of a curvature to kind of follow those back doors, but it's about 22 inches here front to back. So total, that is over 2,000 square inches of countertop surface or right about 14 square feet. If we come over here closer to the stove, you will notice I've recessed my induction stove into the countertop. So that glass that has just a tiny bevel along the edge is just barely proud of the countertop surface. That's something I wanted for just a nice and clean look. It took me quite a bit of time to get this gap as tiny as possible just to avoid getting gunk in there. But if we do need to clean that area, it's pretty easy to just push the stove up from the bottom and clean that out periodically as we need. Moving over to the sink, I've got this sink cover that just kind of sits flush with the top of the surface since I've got an undermounted sink. And one thing I've struggled with in other vans is what to do with the sink cover when you're not using it. You know, I've tried making cutting boards out of them, but essentially then the cutting board is bigger than the sink, which makes washing it kind of awkward. So what often happens, I feel like, is the sink cover just ends up kind of getting lost in the van. Like in our last van, this thing just essentially lived behind the driver's seat collecting dust. But in this van, what I wanted is I've got this little thing, you can lift it up and then you can come over here, you can pivot it into the slot I've got made and it kind of becomes a countertop extension. Purposely tried to make it a fairly like good friction fit. So even if we forget about this and start driving, I don't think it's just gonna fall off right away. If we were to be, you know, speeding around in the van or trying to off-road something, perhaps that'd be an issue, but it just fits nicely on there with kind of a minimal little bracket that will go over. I decided to see if I could lighten this countertop up by essentially removing thickness from areas I didn't think it was critical on the underside. Now this process took quite a few hours with the router and produced kind of an incredible amount of microplastics. But at the end of the video, we'll talk about how much weight this saved if you wanna to try to attempt the same thing. And then finally, we've got this kind of L portion, this back piece of this countertop. Now I can remove this with just six screws from the bottom. So if I like end up picking up some plywood somewhere or I wanna move some furniture, I can easily just pull this out. This has a nice radius edge and I didn't want this to just 
you know, transition to a sharp corner once we pull this out. So I've got just a little bit of detail here about how I shaped this so it kind of rolls over it. And as a result, this seam is just very minuscule when the countertop is installed. And if we do pull it out, it just feels like a natural transition or it's just seamless then. But before we dive into all those little details, let's talk about basically how we get from a sheet of solid surface or Corian to what you see right here. So solid surface countertops come in a sheet. And working with them, I would say, is just sort of like working with a really, really heavy sheet of plywood. For dimensioning, you can essentially use any of the same methods you usually use. So circular saw, table saw, jigsaw, router, all those same things work. It's just a little more work to manhandle the material, especially like when trying to get it up onto the table saw. And your feed rates or like your cutting rates with like the jigsaw, router, or any kind of circular cutter, is just going to be quite a bit slower because the stuff is dense and it does bog down your tools. And I should add that before I even make my first cut in that countertop material, I've already made a template out of some cheap crappy plywood of what shape I need this thing to become. Vans are a mystery sometimes. There's basically no surfaces that are square to each other. There's slight curves everywhere. So it's a lot less frustrating to burn, you know, a $15 piece of plywood than a nice expensive countertop if you miscut something. In this van, this template was critical. The clearance from my sink underneath is less than an eighth of an inch left to right. So I had to just nail this hole to make sure it was positioned correctly. So using that template, I ended up cutting the countertop to the correct outside shape. I usually worry about the sink and stove holes later, but for now I just get the outside shape cut and then I worry about the edge. Now this stuff comes a half inch thick, which I do think looks okay, but if you can double over that countertop lip so it looks like a one inch thick material, I think it just aesthetically looks a lot nicer. So this is a good time to talk about adhesives or specifically epoxy. Now, if you work in a countertop shop or do this quite a bit, I would recommend you actually do buy the specific color matched epoxies that they sell for these countertops. But for me and how small the countertops these are, I find it easier to just work with some more general products. Now, the two epoxies I'd like to use are first is this West Systems G-Flex. And this is described as G-Flex 650 is toughened to make structural bonds that absorb the stress of expansion, contraction, shock, and vibration, which sounds pretty fitting for a van environment. But there's a couple of things when working with epoxies that this long cure time is kind of an inhibitor for. So then I like to use West Systems G5, which is just like a regular five minute epoxy. But I feel like by getting the West Systems label, it's probably a slightly better product than just the cheapest stuff you can get locally. And then the third thing I sometimes use is some kind of tint or pigment. So on this countertop with this dark gray, there's a couple areas where I use some black trans tint that we'll get to. So how do I use these epoxies? I think the name of the game here is in general. I have some like rough guidelines as to when I use which epoxy and how I use them. But honestly, there'll be times where I forgot to glue something with the G Flex and I don't want to wait overnight for it to cure again. So I'll just use the G5 in place if it's just a small piece. Now G Flex is like a yellowish clear epoxy. I think the seams that it produces basically disappear as long as they were nice tight fitting seams to start with and as long as you're working with a countertop material that is darker than the epoxy. So with this stuff, short of it being like a white color, you can hide those seams very, very well. That said, if the seam is at a right angle, so think of like a fillet weld, like when you're welding or something, you know, you might have just a little bit of epoxy buildup in the corner. I will use a little tint to try to match that because I think like a black line along an edge like this isn't too offending. But for instance, on the underside of this countertop where I actually didn't clean up the glue during the glue up or afterwards, that yellowish kind of tint really sticks out. So that's a location where I would use some of that tint. And finally, the G5, I only really use for two things. The first is like for repairs. Like if you notice on this little corner here, I cut a little too far and I ended up using a little bit of this G5 along with a little piece of the countertop material to essentially patch up this little hole here. And now I think it looks quite nice. And then the other place I use it is when I'm installing my threaded fasteners into the bottom for having a way to bolt this thing down. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So back to the edging though, I coat the surface with the G5. I put the little strips down along the edge and then I essentially use every squeeze clamp I have to just firmly hold that overnight. I try to err on the side of having the small strips slightly overhang the actual countertop because then after it cures the next day, you can just come back with a trim router and cut it nice and flat along the surface. And as you see, after a little bit of sanding, the seam basically disappears. And I think this just looks like a really nice and like thicker countertop. And that is a really important factor. All this countertop stuff, you do have to sand to a pretty high grit, but it is really easy to get a nice finished surface by just sanding solid surface. 
on these front edges here, I think if I did sand to like a 2000 grit or whatever they recommend in the manual, I could get it to look identical to the actual surface of this thing. But I find that if the surface is a little duller along the front edge here, I don't think it really makes a difference because you're kind of looking at two planes, so they're never sharing like the same exact light look. Now, every edge that I end up kind of having on the front here ends up getting a small round over. But on this countertop, there's a little bit of extra complexity between some of like the raised backing or the raised edging. So I kind of do this in a piecewise fashion, but generally just adding a small round over just makes a nice and finished product. Now, before we dive into the details of how I like recessed my stove and like this sink cover, I'm just gonna kind of talk about the last like critical step if you're building this countertop. If you're not doing any fancy like sink work or like a countersunk stove, then all you really need left to do is how to fasten this thing to the cabinet. And for that, I like to use threaded fasteners. Now there are specific fasteners for solid surface materials called keep nuts, but I prefer to use these little brass inserts. I think on a van countertop, there's a lot of areas that end up being really skinny, kind of like this area behind the sink here or this area behind the stove. And I think if you have an anchor that has too much kind of like wedge force when you're driving it in, I have found you can just crack the solid surface material in these areas. So for me, I like to use these little brass inserts from MacMaster, and I specifically use a drill bit that's sized so you have just a very tiny bit of driving force left to keep those things in. Since that driving force then is so minimal, if pull-out force isn't very strong either, so to supplement it, I end up using that G5 epoxy in these places. Now, drilling these holes is kind of stressful. You could easily blow out through the backside, so some precautions I take is I actually start every hole with a little pilot bit, and then I actually end up using a brad point drill bit, which leaves a fairly flat hole, but I have ground down that center tip to make sure it doesn't get too close to the top surface of the countertop. To have my depths be nice and consistent, I use one of these Rockler handheld drill jigs, and it just makes it so I can set it so I am always getting the same size hole. And with that ground down drill bit, I'm not worried about that center tip getting too close to the top. This is about a 12 millimeter thick countertop, and you're gonna be drilling over two thirds of the way through it in order to have these brass fasteners sit in there properly. So once the holes are drilled, it's time to insert the fasteners. Now I'm using M6 fasteners to hold my countertop down. I think you could get away with M5 and I actually use a few M5 fasteners in just a couple spots like my sink and this little end piece of trim. But I think M6 is about the largest fastener you can use. I think if you went up to M8, there's just not enough countertop thickness. Now, as I said, I use epoxy to help hold these threaded inserts in. And I think a good trick I've kind of come up with to keep the epoxy from getting onto the threads is I use a bunch of old M6 screws and I essentially pre-thread them into the fasteners. Then after I coat the outside of the threaded insert with epoxy, I actually drive it in with the screw installed. This keeps the epoxy from pushing up into the threaded area and instead it's kind of forced to kind of surround the fastener in the hole and push out around it. Then I just unscrew the fastener and let the thing cure. After a couple hours, I use either a chisel or like a flat file to kind of just work that epoxy nice and flat. And then you've got just a bunch of threaded inserts that you can use then to install your countertop. Now I've seen people install entire countertops with just like four little L brackets, especially going into particle port. I just don't think that that would hold up in kind of a stressful situation, you could say. So on this countertop, I've actually got 12 threaded inserts installed to the bottom of it that are helping to hold it down to my kitchen. And that's kind of the general process, you know, taking you from just a sheet of this material all the way to the point where you have a countertop you can mount now. Now let's talk about some of these more specific details that I think make this countertop a little more uh, useful. So to get the stove to be inset the way it is, I basically start by just cutting out the regular hole for this countertop. And then to get this stepped edge profile, I really recommend you just make another template out of plywood. Now you wanna make a template that's quite snug to the outside of the stove and around the corners here, it takes a little bit of work to match the corner radius of that glass cover. But once you've got this cut out, all you have to do is kind of center it over your stove hole. And then you just got to use a pattern bit with the top bearing and just make sure that you're cutting at the right depth for your stove. So on this template, I actually ended up using some wood spacers underneath so I could get that router bit to sit at the right height. Here is essentially what it looked like. So here's just a little more detail. This is that template I made to essentially recess my stove into the countertop. And you wanna end up using kind of a piece of spacer wood, like you see here. I ended up gluing this kind of spacer ring around so that when it would sit on top of my countertop and it was time to make my cut, then with my pattern bit, that spacer essentially allows this to be positioned in a way so it's cutting to the right depth. 
versus if the spacer wasn't here, then by the time this little bearing could register on the template, this would have plunged all the way through. So you wanna make sure that your kind of trim ring or your uh, template ring is the proper thickness. Now for this sink cutout, I actually ended up using that same 1 16th inch router bit that you may have seen in other videos. Now usually for solid surface materials, this step isn't necessary. All of this looks uniform, so it actually makes it a lot easier usually is you just rough it out with a jigsaw and you can come back with the router and make nice straight cutouts all the way around the side. That said, the sheet of remnant I ended up picking up from a local countertop shop. I didn't have quite enough material to be able to use another piece, so I actually ended up plunge routing this all the way around with the 1 16th inch router bit. As I've shown in other videos, uh, wear some eye protection. I actually ended up snapping one of these bits and I think I've done this four or five times before and I'm still yet to ever find the router bit after it snaps. Here's a video of when it happened. As you can see, I'm more surprised than anything as I realize I've broken another bit. And now let's talk about the sink cover. Now to make this thing work, I didn't want any kind of toggle or any kind of thing you had to fasten down. I just wanted it to be one smooth motion. So this thing you can just pick up and it just kind of clicks into place with friction like that. And then to remove it is just the same single motion. And that is what I really wanted in this system. So on the bottom of the sink, if we turn it over to have kind of the most minimal design, all that's really necessary is I've got this groove cut here along with this kind of raised piece of aluminum. And on the side of the countertop here, I've just got a groove cut in here and this is curved over, which would have happened anyways there. Now to demonstrate how this works and to kind of point out some of the most important things you got to kind of fine tune, here's the two pieces I actually used as my prototype. So this kind of groove right here, that's the same groove as over here on the side of the counter. And then this is the bottom of the sink. Right now it's laying like this, but when it's used, it becomes like this. So these two, you can see they come along and they just click into each other like that. And it really does take a lot of fine tuning. So let me just point out some of these critical cuts and how they were done. First off, this groove was just done on the table saw. As you can see though, it does have a slight angle at the top. And I found this to be critical because as these two are camming together, that piece of aluminum needs somewhere to kind of leverage over to. So by putting that at that angle, it essentially gives it the room it needs to not bind when you're inserting it and removing it. This top is just done with a round over bit on each side. And I use a 3 16 inch round over here. 3 16 times two is 3 8 So for this cut right here, this groove, I actually used a 3 8 inch, what's called box core, which just basically looks like a round router bit. And this is obviously a half inch thick material though. So this cut was made by just nudging this over ever so slightly until the fit was just perfect. Now this cut right here was probably the most irritating to make because it is the same cut as here. So that I essentially shave off a hair, have to reattach this metal piece with all the screws, retest the fit between that and this. And if it was still binding a little bit, then I would make this a little wider and retest. About the only other thing to pay attention to is the thickness of this little plastic shim here, which here is shown by this piece of wood right here. If this was, you know, a little too short, then as I would try to assemble these together, this would bind up and it wouldn't allow it to rotate over. And if it was too long, then it essentially would have too much room and then it would sag down like this. So those two things, that's kind of in a hole what you gotta fine tune. It's hard for me to give exact measurements because I honestly think if you're off by like 10 thousandths of an inch on one of these, then it will slightly change the rest of the dimensions and you just kinda gotta play around until you get it right. But the two big things you adjust as you go is the thickness of this thing. You can just take hairs off of that and the width of this and then eventually you'll find that spot where it all just kind of fits well together. As you'll notice, this piece is removable. I actually didn't end up epoxying it on, but I put some threaded inserts into the end here so I could screw this on. Part of me thinks if this does loosen up, um, I may either have to finagle this piece and adjust it, or perhaps like the size of the spacer and the bottom here is gonna have to change. So I've kinda, I think this should last, you know, solid surface materials are quite durable, but just in case something loosens up, I wanted to have the option to kind of finesse this over time if necessary. Okay, and one last little detail here. You know, this is the piece of the countertop that I can remove as I was saying. And then this is my main countertop over here. And as you notice, I have a nice round over along this edge. And I didn't want this to become a square edge and I didn't want a big gap here. So in order to kind of have this fold over, 
I ended up using that 3 8 inch core box bit again to essentially wrap this over. And then this way, when those two are mated, you know, this kind of covers up that gap. So it feels quite close to smooth. And then if we do remove this, that round over is there and it feels nice and seamless. All right, so let's do a little bit of a comparison of solid surface to other countertop options out there. Now, some other materials that I commonly use are either to build a stainless steel countertop for a customer or wood or maybe a combination of those two. And I think both of these options can look great. I've had some wood countertops that I'm really happy with how they came out with, and I've made some stainless steel countertops that I think just look stellar. And I've never personally installed a laminate countertop in a van, but that is an option that I've seen people do, and it does seem quite affordable. And then there's a couple things I've never built countertops out of, so I'm not gonna include them in this table, but I've personally been interested in trying to build like an aluminum countertop, especially if you could find someone to anodize you a really big piece of aluminum. And then I've been curious about this stuff called starboard plastic, I've gotten a couple samples of, but I decided to not use in this van because it kind of felt like my entire countertop was made out of a giant plastic cutting board. And I'm not going to put stone or marble on this list. I know that there are some people who've used these in vans and some companies, but I just think they're so heavy and I, I don't see the benefit over solid surface materials, which I think are about 50% lighter, which is what I used in this van. So let's make a table and compare these four most common options. Now I think durability, I think about in two ways. I think there's like the mechanical durability standpoint and I think there's an aesthetic durability. And honestly, I think all four of these done correctly will, will do just fine in all of these. Um, I have a couple question marks with laminate. I think I've seen people that uh, have exposed plywood edges on their laminate countertops that can get some water damage causing delamination. And then long-term, if you do have a particle board core, perhaps the vibration will break things down. But I think even that, if installed properly, can be mitigated. And then on the aesthetic side, you know, I'll put a kind of an asterisk next to wood because I do think that it will take some maintenance depending on the finish you use. And in terms of stainless steel, it does kind of scuff pretty easily as you're wiping it clean. So that is just something to keep in mind is that over time, it's not gonna have this like super great uniform look that it had on the day it was installed. It will start to look maybe a little more utilitarian. Another column I'd add to this table, I'd call the DIY ability. And this is basically, if you're starting with just like a raw material, like raw wood or a sheet of the solid surface, how hard is it to kind of see it through to a finished product? And I think wood and solid surface are about the easiest too. You know, wood cuts a little easier, but it takes a lot more sanding and finish work. You could say laminate is truly the easiest if you can find a pre-made product you're happy with. But I think as I alluded earlier, using some of that particle board as the substrate, you know, that can have some uh, long-term durability issues. And if you want to glue your own laminate to either like a plywood core or something, then I think there's a little bit of a learning curve on like what adhesives to use, how to try to round over that front edge. And if you don't want to round it over, how to like seal your edge banding nicely so you don't have any delamination issues. And then stainless steel, every time I've made a stainless steel countertop, I end up having to outsource kind of making that outside skin to a local metal shop. You know, they bend the edges all nicely for me. They weld the corners nicely. And then I just do more of the finish work, which would be like cutting out the sink and stove holes, uh, gluing these down to like a foam core um, and stuff like that. But I do not have the tools to bend these edges nicely. So I think from a true DIY perspective of like, if you were just to start with the sheet of uh, stainless steel, I think that is a pretty intimidating and pretty uh, machinery heavy process. Well, let's talk about the big one, which I think would be price. And I think solid surface generally has a reputation of being on the more expensive end of the scale. And I think if you're a hundred percent set on like one specific texture or color, then you may end up spending a lot. But for me, I say, if you just have a little flexibility, then I would figure out exactly what size you need and then I would start calling some local cabinet shops or countertop shops. This countertop for this van, I ended up buying a chunk, like a remnant from a local shop that was 28 inches wide and 118 inches long. And I paid only $250 for that. That price per square foot is comparable to any kind of like better quality hardwoods I could buy locally, which usually range from about eight to like $15 a square foot around here. But again, you gotta be flexible. If I wanted just like one specific color, like I had my eyes set on just one countertop option, I probably would have paid close to $1,000 to have somebody freight me in a sheet of that size. So be flexible, go to some local cabinet shops and hopefully they'll have an option that will work for you. And finally, let's talk about weight. Now solid surface at the start here is one of the worst in this category. Minus maybe stone, but as I said, we're not even considering that. So per square foot solid surface, is about four and a half pounds per square foot. This LG HiMax product I use is technically 4.4 pounds per square foot. 
but some other like Formica products are closer to five pounds per square foot. If we look at woods, if you go with pine, it comes in at just under two pounds per square foot. Walnut and cherry are about two and a half pounds per square foot. And then like a hard maple approach is three. If you went with something really fancy, like a Wenge or like an Ipe countertop, you could push this into the four or five pounds per square foot category. But for like most normal species, you're under three pounds per square foot. For laminates, I think from what I could find, pre-made laminate countertops are about four pounds per square foot. But if you were, you know, to just glue up your own laminate top to like a half inch plywood, you could get this down to about two pounds per square foot. And then stainless steel, the countertops I've had built for me uh, were 18 gauge stainless steel, which as a raw material is about two pounds per square foot. And usually I glue that to a foam core with an eighth inch piece of plywood underneath. And all that combined, that kind of stainless steel foam and plywood sandwich, um, it comes out to about two and a half, maybe three pounds per square foot. So still considerably lighter than solid surface options. So in this van, I decided to do a little experiment and try to remove some of that material from the underside. As I had mentioned earlier, you can buy solid surface materials in a quarter inch. They say it is not recommended for horizontal applications, but I would love to get my hands on some. That said, if you buy through solidsurface.com, you have to buy two sheets and nobody locally has ever carried any that I could find. So as a result, I decided to just take that half inch material and see how much I could hog out from underneath. So here we are looking at the underside of that little L section. And as you can see, all of this has been removed here. So there's still some load points onto this aluminum bar about every eight inches. But as a result, we've been able to essentially cut the thickness of all these sections in half. Now, overall, I reduced the weight of my countertop by just over 22%. The main counter that was 29 and a half pounds before, I got down to just about 23 and three quarters pounds. The rear section started at about 21 and a half pounds and I got to just under 16 pounds. And then the sink cover went from just under five pounds to just under four pounds. Now I didn't calculate an exact square footage because you have to consider that in this countertop, you know, you've got the doubled over front edge and then you've got the extra trim around the sides. But at the end, the final weight is just about 43 and a half pounds. So we started with the material that was 4.4 pounds per square foot, and we ended at about three and a half pounds per square foot. Now this still doesn't make it a very lightweight option. Wood would be lighter, stainless steel would be lighter, and depending on how you do your laminate countertops, they would be lighter. But I'm honestly only gaining about a pound per square foot max. So I've probably, my van has maybe gained 15 pounds. Now 15 pounds isn't nothing. One of my build philosophies for a while has been, you know, the whole saying death by a thousand cuts, although it's you know, kind of the opposite. Basically, if every single thing you put in your van is five, 10 pounds heavier, that's how at the end of the day, you just have a big heavy van that's clunky and not very nimble. So as few of those kind of weight splurges as possible is what I shoot for. So with all that, what made this 15 pound weight penalty for solid surface worth it? Well, there's actually like no great reason. I mean, there's like some small reasons, but I can't tell you that this is far and away the best material. I think in a lot of vans, wood would just be fine. I've probably installed more wood countertops than anything else, but some like small reasons that kind of led me to solid surface in this van. First off, this van already has a lot of wood in it. So I think I just wanted a contrast to kind of break up that like all wood look. So it was going to probably be stainless steel or solid surface. With stainless steel, it's really difficult to uh, use undermount sinks and I really wanted an undermount sink. So as a result, you know, solid surface made that easier. I could just recess my sink under the counter. And then the final reason that in the long run may prove to be the most important is I think solid surface, you know, takes no maintenance and on a day in day out basis, it is the easiest to keep clean. It just wipes better. It doesn't stain or have kind of like a streaky look like stainless steel might. So it is just the easiest product to use, I believe, out there. And that's that. I think maybe that's a little disappointing, but there's no just like knockout, fantastic reason why solid surface is better. As I alluded at the start of this video, I think you could build a wood countertop that will last you for the life of your van. You, know, you could have a stainless steel countertop that will be fantastic. There's these little reasons why I prefer solid surface. And I think with a little extra work, you can make it just marginally heavier than other options. And if you're a patient and willing to look around a little bit, I think you can find a countertop shop that will make it not even that expensive of an option. So anyways, I hope watching this video, you either got some inspiration for your own van, or maybe you learned something about how to work with solid surface. And yeah, just as always, thanks so much for watching everyone.